Welcome to a second talk for today's symposium. I'm gonna get rid of my cat, kind of, you know, professional. Um, um, yeah, so we just had uh, our first talk um, on a lot of things concerning NFTs. I think one of the conclusion was that is um, a very big world out there. Um, I highlighted some, uh, let's say, shifts between traditional art world, uh, tech world, digital art world, crypto, etc. Um, and we talk about the environmental impact. Um, we talked a little bit about uh, Web3. Um, and um, I think I would like a little recap with some links that we had from that previous conversation. People were very active in the chat, but that was very nice. Um, and now we're gonna focus a bit more on NFT and collecting. Um, so I'll just reintroduce a little bit from the art world point of view that I represent as an art writer and critic uh, who is somehow linked to, linked to art pool, but working very separately, doing Curtain Magazine, a magazine that focuses on curators. I don't do anything with NFTs per se, uh, but um, used to report about uh, big art events, biennials, much more so before I moved to Lisbon. Um, but I'm very interested about NFT and I think for this conversation it can be a bit more centered uh, on the collecting and on the museum and I have some question regarding that uh, as we define from the first conversation NFTs it's not me saying that uh, but more everybody else are not artworks um, the contracts the smart contracts the rows of data um, I'd like to believe maybe they can become artworks for artists I leave it to them and the creativity to come up with something because as we said it we only at the beginning of this enormous enormous world um, of NFT, blockchain, etc., and words I don't understand yet. Um, I will mention, however, uh, from my side, from the art industry side, that there is a stigma that comes with NFTs um, that are considered environmentally very unfriendly and also a tool for speculation and scamming. So I'm, I'm not going to defend that position too strongly. I'm just going to bring a little bit because I think it, it will be relevant for questions about collecting. I'm joined today by, um, for the second talk, but um, also a wide variety of um, personalities. I will let you each introduce yourself actually for this one a little bit shortly um, and see how we can take it from there and go into questions of what can NFT do for art collections, how to collect, um, how are they useful, um, and more questions that I prepared here. Also from the audience, you can leave comments in the chat room. Um, I was very lucky in the first conversation, people answered each other, so that was fantastic and left links, so it can just go this way as well. If there are questions left at the end, I will transmit them um, to our speakers. So, with that said, uh, Pauline, perhaps I will have you again introduced since you're the host. Art Pool is the one behind this initiative. And tell us why you thought that this subject of NFTs is important for museums, institutions, private collectors, and curators. Yes. So hi again, everyone, for, for the one who stick with us or for the new ones. Um, so I'm Pauline, I'm the CEO and founder of Art Pool. Just to reframe what we are doing, what we have do, done for the past now three years, um, we built up a social network for the art world, but specifically centered around art curators. Um, in my background, I, I also I did fundraising for an art institution. Um, I have experienced how hard it is to raise funds in the in the physical world with with all the possible ideas that I had. And, um, you know, talking with curators for the past three years, we have now on board more than 850 curators on the platform uh, from 75 countries. A question that was coming back was the same question I was uh, 
trying to reply every single day for almost three years in Hong Kong, which was uh, how can you fundraise for um, physical activities? And um, what happened is I had this in mind, building the network with, with the team. And um, it was really the question that I uh, hope we will tackle answering um, is how, yeah, how can the digital help the physical art world? Um, and then encountered NFTs. Uh, it's going to be what nine months now. Um, so I'm still pretty new in the space, but nine months is still a lot to learn. And and I I I feel I got a to actually some of you are here, um, and I felt like it was a brilliant tool um, to introduce to the community of curators that we have built. And that it could be really interesting to see it as, as a tool for fundraising for physical activities. Um, and, um, and yeah, that's basically why I'm here. I think like uh, it's linked between the NFTs, the institutional world. Um, I had the, well, I have the chance to work with Irina a lot because we're building a unique network. Um, I've met Jehan uh, not so long ago in, in Porto. Um, and, and we had a, a very interesting discussion uh, as Jehan as, as kind of the double cap, let's say. And Ari, I met you uh, in NFT London, so I'm really happy that you're here. And Aldo, we, we have been working on potentially a project together in, in the museum, so it's, it's real. Um, there is the art world that is interested in, in, in fundraising via NFTs. Um, there is collectors collecting NFTs from artists from the digital art world, but also from artists coming from the physical art world and onboarding. So that's it. Thank you. Um, very well. I uh, would um, like to actually start with Jehan because um, I've recently heard that uh, Asian collectors are maybe a bit more open to get into this new world than other are and I want to have the impression since um, you as Pauline say you have two hats and you're on the board of Parasite which is historically an artist started institution uh, and now just an institution and you're also in this crypto world so perhaps you can introduce us to what are NFTs for you and how they useful in the private and institutional sector and for collectors. Sure, thanks so much, Pauline and Christina for having me. Um, yeah, maybe I'll just give a, a quick introduction to myself so you have a, so the audience has a sense of, you know, my, myself and my background. So I, I've, um, I've been in the art world for a number of years. I used to work at Sotheby's uh, in technology for about eight years uh, in New York uh, and Hong Kong. They actually brought me out to Hong Kong in 2006. And then I actually left in 2008, became an art dealer. So I've uh, been an art advisor. I was an art advisor for about 2008 to 2016 and I did the whole circuit you know, the Basels, Venice, Document, uh, um, and I was very involved in both the commercial side as well as the not-for-profit side. Uh, as Christina mentioned, uh, I was on the board of Parasite. Seven, I joined in around 2008, I believe. Um, so I had a really, you know, great education in terms of the critical aspect of art practice, as opposed to the commercial side of art practice, which you really see, you know, more in the headlines. It's the Art Basels, it's the Sotheby's and the Christie's, the headlines, but a lot of the really on the ground work uh, and development and real rigor in the art world actually happens, you know, in the grassroots uh, with the parasite. To have that, you know, kind of dual education. Uh, in 2013, I got into Bitcoin personally, just, you know, fascinated by the ideas, loved this concept of it being the next, you know, the next internet. And I thought that was an amazing opportunity uh, and just a beautiful technology and community. Uh, and so I started the Ethereum community in Hong Kong back at that time and got very close to the whole, you know, Vitalik and the Ethereum community. Um, started my firm, Kinetic, in 2016. Uh, after having invested myself for a few years, and Kinetic is uh, one of the earliest in investors in blockchain and crypto in Asia. We were the first VC, blockchain VC in Hong Kong. Uh, to date, we've now invested in over 220 projects, uh, including, for those of you who are familiar with crypto, Polkadot, FTX, Solana, uh, Decentraland, 
um, you know, BlockFi. Uh, so really, we were fortunate to invest in some of the biggest projects in the space, uh, all in the very earliest rounds. Um, so, you know, we were fortunate to be in the right place at the right time uh, and lucky enough to make some of the right decisions. And um, as part of that journey, I also got really into NFTs. We were investors in Decentraland, which is the primary, one of the primary metaverse spaces back in 2017 and 18 is when we invested. We bought a lot of land uh, and that gave us kind of our first initial um, taste of what NFTs were. Uh, and it was funny actually, because at that time we were looking, you know, being in Hong Kong, which is a real estate town, we were, we had actually real estate developers advising us on what land to buy on this kind of virtual map um, using traditional metrics and, and ideas of real estate traffic to understand which would be the most valuable plots of land. And it's really funny, three, four years later, like they were actually right. So it's interesting how these worlds actually have relevance to each other. And, and you know, I guess we'll come back to it, but fundamental expertise and fundamental understandings of value still apply. Um, fast forward, we've invested in over, you know, I think 20 NFT platforms, uh, including uh, TR Lab, which did the Tsai Gua Chang uh, drop, uh, Eternity, which is more around trading collectibles. Um, we've just recently completed an investment to a new platform called Evo Art, um, which is started by a woman named Michelle Macaron, who is a kind of a well-known gallerist in New York, um, and uh, a few others that were that are kind of not announced yet. Uh, but so we've been very active in the space. I personally work directly with Beeple, uh, the NFT artist, uh, Rafik Anadol, another great artist in the space. Um, as well as a few others that I support, Ash Thorpe, or, or another really great artist. Uh, and I collect their work as well as fine art NFTs, uh, as well as things like Urs Fisher, Tom Sachs. Uh, and I work relatively closely with the Serpentine Gallery uh, to help them understand how they're thinking about metaverse. So I try to get involved not only on the commercial side of NFTs and fine art NFTs, but also the, the institutional side and uh, working with curators to help them you know, kind of become more comfortable. Uh, with the space. So uh, just to bring it back to your question, Christina, you know, what do NFTs mean to me? Uh, I think it's a, it's a medium. It's a surface uh, like many others. It's in a fine art context. It's like many other things. Um, it's oil and, and brush. It's, you know, watercolor. It's clay and a kiln. Uh, there's so many ways to kind of think about the NFT space. It's not magic. It's not voodoo. Uh, it still requires, you know, innovative thought uh, and criticality in terms of practice. Uh, and I think that where we are in terms of fine art practice of NFTs is really, really the beginning stages. I think the vast majority of, of you know, experienced fine artists have not meaningfully engaged with the medium, uh, but I think that they're starting to be more open to it. Um, I actually think that the high prices of NFTs have scared many people away. And I think, you know, to, to, your, to your phrasing, uh, Christina, of the stigma, um, I don't think there's a stigma for NFTs. I think there's um, a misunderstanding and a fear of the unknown. Um, I think there's also a fear of, you know, being too commercial or seeming to be too commercial. What I find is actually a lot of artists like wouldn't mind to be a little bit more commercial if they could support their practice, but they definitely don't want to be seen as being commercial. And they're, they're, that's a diff I think there's a difference. Um, but I do think that over time, the medium will become more normalized. We won't think of it as NFT art. We won't have a schism between quote unquote NFT artists and fine artists. They'll converge. Uh, and I, for me, I believe in the fine art practice, a lot of the traditional mechanisms and infrastructure uh, and ways of, of seeing and understanding um, will assimilate this new medium uh, and we'll be back to the normal art world and it'll just be art. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, in the first talk, I did a very long introduction and explaining this notion of stigma. That's why I kind of bypassed it this time. But um, um, please do the, um, I mean, it's okay. I, I think it will come back. And, and since I feel like I've just talked about it, I don't want to repeat for the audience. And anyway, you mentioned similar things. So um, it's all very clear on that. But I do want to know a bit about the Asian collectors. Uh, um, and uh, is there more openness, you know, coming from Asia? Yes. Um, sure. And like, how do you feel? Because uh, that's also the feeling I have. And I also mentioned, I don't know much about NFT, which I mentioned in the first talk uh, about this word, but I'm not outraged. Um, I'm open to the idea. And also I find it, I said, 
in the in the, initially I said I think it's unfair to just discard them, especially since I see more initiative coming from the south uh, south countries. Um, what we used to call like third world or whatever, emerging, developing, basically not the white to white uh, English speaking main narrative. So that's why I'm very also intrigued about your opinion on this Asian culture of openness and having lived in Hong sure. Kong, how people are more open. Yeah. I, I, I would like to hear from your cat. I think your cat has something to say, uh, you know, uh, yeah. and, you know, it's, it's open. We should be open. Yes, yes. We're all for non-human interaction, but I just don't want to waste time too much on that one. But yeah. Fair enough, fair um, enough. Uh, I mean, just to cover off the, the Asian part, I think that, uh, you know, it's, I think tends to be a slightly more uh, digitally, di digitally native uh, kind of culture uh, for some reason. Obviously, you know, the penetration uh, of technology, I would say, is, is probably um, uh, higher. Uh, and deeper in China, Japan, and Korea. Um, and so I think that lends itself to being a fertile ground to adopt things like digital assets. Like I think digital assets have been native to China for many years, whereas I think that it's only starting to be uh, more native to the, you know, uh, the US and, and Europe. Uh, so it makes sense that there would be faster, you know, more and faster interest and familiarity. Um, I don't necessarily think that there's you know, more interest in NFTs from, from Asia. Um, I do think that from my personal observation, there's a lot, it does feel like there's a lot more openness to it, um, but uh, I'm not sure I would, you know, make any kind of large judgment about Asia being, you know, a bigger, a bigger, you know, kind of response or a bigger audience for NFTs. Uh, it's just a bigger audience generally. Um, so yeah, I think Asia has a lot of potential. Um, just like everywhere else, I think that a lot of education needs to be done and um, it's hard to say who, who will be doing that education. Um, I think, unfortunately, it's probably going to be a lot more of the uh, commercial platforms uh, because they're moving faster. I think the institutions, I mean, institutional contemporary art in general in Asia is weaker. Uh, they just don't have as many museums. Obviously, we have M plus in Hong Kong, which is you know, the, the, it's called the Tate Modern of, of kind of Asia. Um, but other than that, there's not many large scale institutions that can kind of anchor uh, a lot of this discourse uh, and education and mount uh, a drive the way that MoMA could or the way that, you know, the Tate itself could. So if anything, I think that, you know, we'll struggle a bit uh, on the, you know, blue chip institutional side, but hopefully, you know, the, the parasites and the other, you know, non for profits will, will be faster, um, you know, on the, on the gun there. Yeah, um, thank you. I think these are Good point as a parallel, actually, from my perspective, um, that maybe people are more open to new ideas from places where institutions are actually less established, which might explain the, my Asian remark, um, which is something that came up actually when I was researching for these talks. Um, so maybe I wanna, I wanna turn to, um, uh, to Aldo. Hi Aldo, since uh, you are a museum person, museum founder, and you're here, so obviously you're, you're curious um, about the NFT world. Um, and I wanna hear from you about um, at, what is the stage of your, of your interest here? We'll come back to you later afterwards too, because I wanna ask to other intervenants, other participants, um, what can be the ways NFTs can be used in the collecting and institutional world from the artworks themselves to, um, to being ledger for, for, to track the prominence of artworks to, um, and other ideas that I'll just throw in the, in the mix. So Aldo, please tell us um, a bit more about yourself. Uh, thanks, Christina. Hi to everyone. Uh, um, <clears throat> Uh, as a um, president of Museum of Contemporary Art, uh, I'm interested in uh, NFTs. I know about NFTs because at the same time, I was a banker my whole life, working in New York. Uh, but uh, talking about the, from the perspective of museum in, in our, from our museum, uh, the idea of the NFT is, uh, very good tool uh, as of today uh, to 
make fundraising for exhibitions and or for support artists. We are not thinking uh, at, at the moment to invest in NFT uh, as part of our permanent collection. It doesn't mean that we are not going to do it in the near future, but uh, for the moment, no. Uh, NFT, I think that is something that is going to remain, something strong that is uh, has an evolution in a daily basis and is getting more and more important and more popular. Um, is something that is not going to replace the traditional uh, art. And I think that is not the, what they are looking for, the NFT artists. And I think that uh, since they are in, a, even the growth has been really quick. Uh, I think that we need to see still um, some time to come uh, to understand better uh, the idea of the NFT. Um, what is the mission in the in the art world? So I found super interesting this uh, this talk. Uh, I learned a lot and the previous one. So I'm really I'm really on top of the NFTs. Uh, thanks to Paulina, I understood much more. I'm working trying to work with her in an exhibition fundraising for an exhibition. So. Um, and that... Excellent. No, makes sense. Makes sense. I hope we can. Um, I'm there too. I hope we can uh, unpack all of this. Um, therefore, I perhaps like to pass uh, the mic to Harry, because um, I understand you do some advising, uh, advisory work. So you probably a very good voice to tell us more about what is your business and how and if you can help sure. all these well, art people. Well, yeah, it's great to be here and hear from Jehan and Aldo and to see Pauline again. Um, yeah, so I work with Fanny Lakubai at Lal Art and we're a crypto art advisory um, providing workshops and guidance for corporate corporations, startups and artists. Um, we think NFTs aren't going to replace anything, but we do think that they can comfortably coexist with all the utilities they bring, um, such as provenance and um, excellent documentation for the future. Um, I've been in this space for just over a year, and um, the whole time I've seen NFTs have a big impact on emerging artists and established ones. So um, we work with art organizations such as Vertical Crypto Art and Bastari and um, electric artifacts in finding artists who come from um, contexts which in perhaps in the normal traditional art world it would be hard for them to find a platform to present themselves um, but with nfts um, they've been able to find an international community um, and find an international um, group of collectors in which to to sell works to and um, We've also seen established artists that we that we have worked with in the past um, becoming more and more um, in dialogue with organizations such as Sotheby's and Christie's and um, through these experiences and with what we provide to our collectors uh, we think NFTs have really kind of um, they've posed a lot of questions a lot of curatorial questions that um, I don't think prior to 2020 were really being asked so um, I hope that answers the question. <laughs> uh, well, it's just about a good introduction, I'd say. But, um, cool. <laughs> but you meant, yes, because, um, well, for example, I'd like to know which questions you, you're talking about, about the curatorial questions. Uh, yeah. But we can talk about this, um, for example, just answering this. If I'm a collector uh, collecting NFT art, um, I know from... From I'm not a collector, but I've been in plenty of situations around them. And uh, usually it's over drinks, gallery dinners, um, and people talk about what they collect and what they love and the artists they follow. Maybe the artists are present um, and it's, you know, it's very merry and uh, very informal. 
if you collect NFT works, and I understand there are a lot of uh, community building online disc through Discord and other things I have no idea about, and I will learn soon, hopefully. But um, uh, how, how do we share? How do you share your NFT collection? You're like, oh, wow, I love this. Like what you, with your phone, with the, how does it, how does it oh. uh, manifest? Well, um, there are solutions out there such as Async um, that have an app for Apple TV and you can share it on there. Um, there's also Canvia frames, which are, which are slightly larger frames to put NFTs on, as well as um, Infinite Objects, which one of our collectors, Elsie, um, recently did an interview with Larry's List and she was presenting works in her home. And it was through these displays, which um, I don't own them myself, but apparently they feel like Apple products. They're really high quality. Um, NFTs can be shown in public settings through through these monitors and displays. Okay, so there are lots of solutions clearly being developed, which um, mm. your comment makes me think about this new museum in Seattle that was just about to open. I don't know if it's open because it was mm. supposed to open in January, but last time I looked, it wasn't yet, but uh, just showing NFTs work. So I think we can be following that development too. And they were trying to bridge uh, and to answer many questions about the environmental impact and the, the um, the bad reputation of the speculative side of a, a, NFTs, etc. Um, Irina, can you can you tell us more about the possibilities that offer NFT for collectors, um, museums, and um, for example, I mean there are there are artworks, but uh, we also mentioned in the first talks that uh, we can use NFTs uh, for in. in all kinds of different ways, uh, maybe for the registrar, for the archives, uh, to know where works come from and the history and who owned them before and what the, I don't know, um, states. Um, we can use them for fundraising. Uh, also fundraising, I imagine, implies that there should be artworks. Um, but then I also, I'll echo a conversation that um, I've reported on in, in a talk I reported on in, in Curtain Magazine uh, about a museum director who, because museums right now are thinking a lot about the museum of the future and how they're gonna operate and how they should rethink themselves. And one of the idea was to make um, the visitors stakeholders. So maybe NFTs can be part of that. I don't know, since you know, it, they break ownership in so many ways. Is Irina still here? I want to hear from her. Yes. yes. At least reintroduce yourself just in case. Um, so yes. Yeah, so um, the head of Metaverse Growth at Unique Network. So wow. helping to grow ecosystem um, and very proud to have founders like Pauline building on Unique Network using our technology and actually uh, doing very, very important and very difficult job in the space um, and, you know, helping museums uh, really curating art, really being in touch with artists and facilitating um, this, you know, very difficult connection because crypto space has its particularity uh, and art space, it's, it's, you know, it's like another universe. So building this bridge between, between the two is very important because NFT technology brings new opportunities. And we've spoke, we talked about, communities in the first part of our symposium today. And this is what I think is also very important for collectors, having access to these communities and actually having access to platforms where they can see other collectors. And Jihan, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but I would really love to hear your input on, input on, on this. Um, when you know, like it's, it's like a, an exclusive club in a way, you invest in an artwork, but you also invest in an artist you support someone uh, in their career and their progress. And it means believing in an artist, believing in, in the type of art they're producing. And I think the community from both collectors, uh, also just like fans of the work followers are very central to, um, to the NFT space and to the new opportunities that this space creates. Uh, and in terms of technology, underlying technology of NFTs, um, I think this brings more transparency. So as a collector, you can make sure 
uh, what you're exactly buying. Uh, you know, all transactions are visible on the blockchain. So you can always track first, um, first transaction, then sales on the secondary, tertiary, et cetera, markets. You always know what your artists have produced. So you can check in tools like the ones we are developing, Block Explorer. Um, sounds scary, but it just um, allows you to track uh, transactions and, and be very transparent for the platform. You can give this layer of transparency um, to your collectors and your audience. You can do many more what Bruno was talking about in the first part. You can gamify things. And with NFTs, art can really have life. So it's not just a um, fixed object that you buy. You actually can buy something that you can create a, a community around it, a club around it, that you can uh, divide the ownership. So you can use fungibility of that NFT. You can make it refungible. You can then um, decide to gamify it in a way and put this art you know, um, into a metaverse, virtual world, into a game. There are so many more ways that which we so have can not... you imagine this? Sorry to interrupt you, but uh, can you imagine this? What you say about gamifying for a museum? Like, what what would it mean? Like, um... well, currently what we're seeing, right? Um, like the first very um, the first barrier to create any exhibition and let's say bring artworks from Hermitage Museum to Victoria and Albert Museum is actually physically transporting these works. Uh, because it takes time, money, or oftentimes permissions are very difficult to obtain. So if a museum can actually create an installation, an immersive space, which everyone can join with, say, virtual reality glasses, or they have an installation in the museum um, using lighting and technology, and then they can sell tickets in the form of NFT, but also these tickets can represent an entrance to a uh, like, um, you know, the, in England, there is this popular thing of friends of the museum. So you are like creating the club. And then with this NFT, you also gain access to other loyalty programs. And you can, for example, uh, become a friend of Tate, but also that gives you access to other exhibitions or to other opportunities or gives you discounts or gives you uh, an opportunity to join a talk. Uh, with an artist or a master class or something like that. So it, it's really like you can be as creative as you wish. And as, as I said, we have not seen much because with the current blockchain technology, uh, many things are difficult, like even refundability. But what we, what we are bringing to the market should really elevate the game. Uh, it would be about relationships. Again, going back to what Bruno was saying, one NFT owns another NFT. We haven't seen use cases yet because literally Unique Network went live uh, a month ago. So we are still to go to Polkadot Parachain. There is still a lot more in terms of tech development uh, and in terms of tool we're releasing. Uh, and I'm actually very much like, I, I really like having a dialogue with artists when artists come to you and say, well, I want to develop these tools. And it, it's great when they don't expect an immediate result because it is still a very complex technology blockchain and there are many things that we need to figure out how to build but having that vision even from an artist it's um it helps a lot even tech company to have a feedback and to know in which direction to move what is important what needs to be done what is what are the pain if we just build a platform and sort of impose the rules, I don't believe that will that would be the right approach because we need to build something that is that helps the artists to express themselves creatively, but also to protect their intellectual rights and also to reach new audiences and present the art in a different way. It's it is very complex, just like the art industry, the art world is very complex. You know, the blockchain technology is same complex. So what we're trying here to do is to be building bridges in different parts with with different institutions, art organizations, communities uh, to really give this life and sense and bring it to the next level, because the art like if we dive into the history of art, right, we had 
uh, there is a huge gap between the art until the era of Salvador Dali and then contemporary art. There is basically, you know, I'm sure many of you know about the book of Goldbridge, the history, the story of art, and then the continuation of uh, contemporary art. There is a gap. They, they were not able, historians were not able to find the real connection between, you know, well, what... A bit, but anyway, I mean, Duchamp, etc. but if Klein, we can, things. But you're right to say that it's very vast and also we're not talking about the same things for... Like basically when you, I realized today when you guys talk about NFT, it's, I don't know, you can, it, it's as if you tell me it's a ruler. So here I have a ruler and what can I do with a ruler? I can do a million things apparently. I can really do a million, like there's so many different use and I can create in so many different ways. Um, I find it actually fascinating. And I think it, it, there is a lot of future in the finding out those pain points that you mentioned. And I think for museums, it can be very interesting if we don't limit ourselves thinking that NFT can only be artworks in this way. Um, so yeah, no, thank you. Um, before we delve a bit more into that, there is um, one actor in the art world that uh, um, has been forgotten in, in both conversations so far, and maybe Pauline, uh, Jihan, maybe Harry, I don't know if uh, how much experience you have with that, but uh, there's a gallerist. Um, I actually really like galleries. Uh, I know Many people have been talking about NFT is great because you're basically bypassing the galleries. The artists can connect with the collectors directly. No need, you know, to talk to the middleman. But um, um, I come from a place where I see a lot of positive things for galleries. They, they do fight a lot for the artists. They do exceptional things. Um, not only showing them, but uh, you know, getting them gigs in museums, helping them with their career in, in so many different ways. So I just want to have your impression, maybe Pauline, Jehan. Um, who else wants to um, jump in? Aldo, if you have, I'm sure you have amazing uh, relationships with um, gallerists and you had over the years. Um, who wants to who wants to comment on that? Then? Sure, I'll, I'll give a, I'll give a quick, quick, quick note on that. So long story, I mean, I think that um, there's a lot of interest in kind of quote unquote disrupting the art world and removing all intermediaries, et cetera. Um, and I think that's kind of premature. Um, I think that the pendulum swings back and forth between, you know, kind of decentralization and centralization in many ways and, and all the kind of gradients in between. I think that galleries are, you know, a necessary part. Of, an necessary part. Oops. Uh, interesting part of the uh, ecosystem. Uh, maybe is there to, there you go. Uh, I think that galleries form a, a really interesting role uh, as they do in the art world. They're not just sales, they're kind of supports, they're guides, they're intermediaries, they're platforms. Um, and a lot of artists actually need that. Uh, I think from a functional standpoint, NFTs have created and digital art in general uh, have created a really great platform for artists to reach um, collectors and their audience directly, which is good. Uh, but I think that there's a, a relatively low ceiling to where that ends up. And if you expand this over time, um, what that means is that there's very little barrier to entry uh, at the at the front end, which means that anybody who has uh, you know a phone uh, and the ability to make digital art can put their art into this space, and it's the same space as everybody else, which is great because it means that you know for cultural uh, inclusion, uh, it's it's great that people who are in you know worse off areas or socioeconomically or even just culturally. Um, you know, depressed areas, they can really have more opportunities. So that in, cultural inclusion is great. But what that means is that there's a lot more noise and not all art is good. And I'll just like say that there's not all art is good. Um, and not all art is, is going to last. In fact, 99.9% .9 of art is, will not last, you know, within three generations, it will be thrown away. Um, and so what galleries and institutions and curators do and critics, uh, what they do is actually they help to add value over time and to focus, you know, the, the, the future history uh, of culture. And I think that that is still an important role and it will remain an important role because just because something can exist forever doesn't mean that it has relevance forever. It doesn't mean that it has quality um, and, you know, adds value to the culture from which it comes. So I think that gallerists are very, very important. I think that galleries for NFT right now are struggling to find their place. 
uh, because they're as unfamiliar with the, the medium and the potential as the artists are, as is the audience. Everybody's just trying to figure it out. So we're in this weird, you know, kind of gray, you know, um, no, no man's land uh, in terms of how everybody fits together. But it's just time. It will figure it out. This is not the first, you know, new art movement. It's not the first new medium. Everybody will readjust. Uh, and for me, I mean, uh, you know, there are galleries that I'm supporting. Again, like Evo Art is one. And um, there's a few other platforms that I, that I, you know, like to work with. And they, you know, they're, they're kind of galleries. They're kind of, you know, auction platforms. They're kind of, um, you know, supporting artists. Uh, again, just got to keep an open mind and, and stay flexible and, and, you know, have some type of true north in terms of what your values are. And then the patience to... Uh, so that's kind of how I see galleries and, and also public institutions. Okay, thank you. Pauline, do you want to chip in since? Yeah. Um, I'm in gallery and I'm, I'm really light with one, but uh, I'm, I'm, I can add a little bit. Um, I, but I we can change angle as well because it's not all about the future. I would like to say we also. No, no, it's um, the actually, experimentation is nice also. and Yeah. So, I come from the gallery world originally, so I think um, I, I I understand very well the role of a gallerist, and I, I truly believe in gallerists. I think they maybe it's not all of them, but I think they do really support an artist. They support an artist in many ways, uh, conceptually, in accompanying them in their career, uh, challenging them with their practice. Uh, and they often the collectors as well, actually. Of course, um, but I also. For many years, I was thinking like galleries, and 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 I was having a gallery, so it's it was, you know, a, a real dis like thinking I had was like what what can a gallery bring to an artist, you know? Because even in Web two, whatever we say, it was easier for collector to, to it's easier for collector to reach artists. Um, the the artists are also doing their communication. I mean, not all of them, but some are are pretty good at it, and which was. A gallery was bringing what was bringing a space, was bringing PR and communication, and was bringing collectors um, and institutions. And and I think like here the gallery can position, and it's a challenge. It's it's you know it's a little bit um, a new role they need to take. But there is, for me, I truly believe in the galleries really um, being more involved with institution. And I'm not just talking about galleries that are really established. I'm I, I'm also talking about. You know, more emerging galleries, having curators, working with institutions. Um, this is the first role that I think a gallery can have. And in the NFT world, it's also doing that support to many artists who don't know where to start, where to go, what to do. Maybe the gallery can bring that knowledge. And, um, and I truly believe in the ecosystem around the artists. I, I don't, uh, I think some artists succeed very well alone. But I also think like many artists do need this ecosystem. This is why we exist, right? Like the, the curators, the institutions, the galleries, the platforms, the, the advisors. I think we, we need this. Um, and, 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 and I think the NFT world also need that. And we, it's just then finding, you know, the right place to be next to the artists in that new space. Yeah, thank you. That's good. Um, there have there, been uh, a few comments. Uh, it's less active than the last talk, so I think this one I can, I can um, I'll be able to recap in a little bit before we, we finish this talk. Um, but I'll, I'll keep it for the end. So people who are listening, you can post your question, try to make them shorter, maybe, because it's a bit hard to listen and read at the same time for me, but um, um, I'll ask them at the end to our participants. Um, I wanted to, so, okay, so I'm a collector. I want to start collecting. Uh, where do I start? Like, um, how much budget do I need? And um, what do I do? What's my next step? Yes, Harry, absolutely. I will think about you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, I would suggest, uh, depending on your budget, and a really great place to start um, is on Tezos with a platform, like, with a platform, Hickey Nunk. Um, can we write it down? Or maybe oh, yeah, absolutely. Or Harry, yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And Aldo, yeah, I'll, you'll talk after that. So um, Tezos uh, provides a lot of solutions um, to the ecological concerns, like the proof of proof of stake. Um, and 
if you're collecting work and you don't quite know what your budget is, this is an excellent place to find emerging artists. So um, there are there are artists such as uh, Felipe Falguieras, which um, I recently worked with, who sells his work um, for, I believe, um, something like twenty pounds. Um, and you can go for works that are a little less, like ten pounds, or dependent on. Um, on what your budget is. The works on there are relatively experimental, although um, different platforms come with different uh, use cases. So for example, you might, you might see a, a work minted on Ethereum through something such as a platform such as Known Origin um, for an artist who wants to show their best work. And what we normally advise um, to collectors is that we start with say, an emerging artist from something like Hick Hick Nunk, um, compared with an established artist um, such as A Lot of Money um, through a platform such as Async, which is a similar principle on, on the Ethereum side um, in showcasing your best work. And um, between establishing, emerging and established artists, we try and get collectors to understand why they bought it, um, just to kind of get an interest going. And um, with... I, I well, sorry to return back to your question. <laughs> um, where to start? I, I think Tezos is a great, and Hikiknong is a great place to begin. Okay, so platforms, excellent, thank you. It reminds me, um, and again, because I have an extended experience with Asia and still have a connection there, living there for 15 years, at the Art for Philippines, uh, started uh, to show NFT art a few, a couple of years ago. Uh, it was like beginning of the pandemic and they did a whole educational thing as well to initiate the uh, collector into it. So I thought that was, it just came back to me. Um, okay, uh, we'll have all those links in, uh, in the chat room. Tezos isn't, maybe Harry, you can add what you said, please for us. Um, so people can- oh, Sorry, um, in so, sorry, somebody sent me a direct message. I think I sent it to them by mistake. Um, here we go. Okay, in the chat room. Excellent, thank you. Um, Aldo, I'm so sorry, I missed you, um, your intervention earlier. Yeah. You probably want to talk about the gallerist or something. Oh, thank, thanks, Christina. Uh, in my experience, I realize as many people maybe uh, in the world uh, about the, um, the success of the NFTs thanks to the auction houses, because uh, as we, everyone knows, uh, all the records that were many of those NFTs sold in auctions uh, brought the attention for, for many people. So that was my case too. I think that the role of the gallery in the traditional artists was, uh, as Pauline said, not all the galleries, but uh, uh, now, now it's like uh, the market of the galleries it's like the big bins became even bigger, and the medium size, small size, really are uh, becoming smaller or even disappear. But the role of the gallery is very important because uh, since the financial situation in many museums in the last years were really bad, many of those big galleries were even patronizing exhibition in museums, so pushing their artists to be part of the exhibition. So the role of a, a good gallery is important. Uh, I don't know uh, what is the market for the NFT in art galleries. I think, yes, I, I think that the galleries specialize in NFT or even the traditional galleries are going to start or become uh, adding artists or NFT more and more. Uh, and again, a good gallery always is going to be important for, for an artist to, to grow and to become a more important and well-established artist. So that was um, what I wanted to say, Christina. Thanks again. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, oh yeah. um, so since you mentioned fundraising before, and um, I'm also very curious about this idea of being able to create, uh, to use uh, NFT or smart contracts, um, this space to be visible um, and to, to be able to fundraise. Um, maybe we can talk about this and how these things can be implemented if they 
if it's also just at the beginning as an idea, um, what are we fundraising? Uh, what kind of products exactly? Since now we establish NFTs, are smart contracts, so it can be it can be so many different things. Um, what are your ideas, uh, Harry, Pauline, Jahan, Irina? I'm sure Aldo would be like me, like listening to the possibilities. Um, what are the possibility in terms of fundraising? And maybe do you have like a success story that you? I think I, think I have one. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm going to cite uh, the Ancient of Days project by Vastari. Arguably, I'm biased because it's my favorite. Um, I'll put this in the chat as well. Um, so the Ancient of Days project was introduced by Vastari Labs uh, in at the University of Manchester with the Whitworth Gallery. And um, the Whitworth Gallery um, is dedicated to improving um, how it interacts with audiences through new technologies. So um, they were looking last year um, at NFTs and asking the same questions. What can they be used for? Like, how can we use them beyond simply minting one of our artworks and saying that's fantastic? Um, so they contacted Vistari Labs um, to see what they could do. And their intention, the Whitworth, was again to put the money back. Whatever profits were made um, from minting uh, what a series of prints from their collection. So uh, William Blake's Agents of Days, um, how that money could be used to benefit the gallery and, and the people who visit it. And so they minted it, um, they minted a series of 50 on the Tezos blockchain with Hikate Nunk and um, celebrated it as the first UK museum NFT. So what that has led to since is um, a, new, a new age of collectors who have bought what I'm one of them, I'm, just, I'm totally biased, but um, the money that has been raised through that, through that case study um, is going towards what was um, intended for the Whitworth last year, uh, money going towards funding their future projects and innovations, and also uh, an exhibition dedicated to it uh, in 2023. So uh, that one's still ongoing. It was presented at uh, Art Basel Miami and um, I just think I think that's a really interesting intersection between. And what about about the people who supported the project? Um, mm -hmm. What did they gain from it? You know, like uh, do you know a little sure. bit about that? Do you have some echoes? Yeah. So, community. Uh, um, although I do believe there are some traditional buyers as well. Um, they felt it, it was it was for. It was in the interest of helping the Whitworth Gallery more than owning the NFT. So um, they were they were helping um, with with that community development in buying it. Okay, thank you. Um, anybody else with a success story? And I'd be interested to hear about things that are not just for helping, because I believe it, since we are in a capitalistic setting, you know, like how can you make it win-win for everybody? Like, this is me saying that who is not, you know, but I, anyway. I kind of like to ask maybe, maybe ask a question here. It's like this idea of fundraising for, for art is maybe slightly different than, you know, how we've th thought about kind of fine art and fine art, you know, kind of market before um, this idea that, you know, there's some type of like, like a fundraise tends to be either, you know, kind of charity driven or philanthropically driven, or it's, it's kind of like speculative, right? And I'm just actually curious how, how people think about this. Are people more because we talked about this stigma right of the commerciality uh, of the art and now we're talking about fundraising so when we're thinking about like what art and nft is uh and this kind of contextualization of it as an asset class in the context of fundraising like is that okay are we are we comfortable with this um are we are okay like placing fine art in the in the realm of you know more squarely in the realm of like investment and being okay with that and speculation uh, and market goes up and market goes down um uh, open question i mean i'll answer it first i think that um i think projects uh as far as fine art is concerned i think that traditional fine art you know you would fundraise for a project right you would fundraise for hey we're doing an exhibition um, at a, a museum, and so we're gonna we're gonna raise funds from the gallery, from some of the collectors, that kind of thing. Um, sometimes there's a community-driven fundraise, but there's no expectation of return. 
uh, typically, right? No direct uh, expectation of return. Now, NFTs and, you know, kind of give us that and token fundraising gives us that uh, as, a, as a baseline. And obviously, you know, a lot of these fundraisers, especially around PFP projects uh, and NFT, like collectible projects, those are straight fundraisers. But um, for me, I think that, I think it's great for artists to sell their work. I start to be a little bit um, less, or more cautious when it comes to things that, you know, make it too speculative. Um, because, you know, bots, communities, investment communities, et cetera, like that's who the market is right now. Um, and I don't know if a lot of artists understand that difference and understand the longer term impact of, you know, having their art be kind of inserted into this um, extremely speculative, and extremely commercial uh, kind of dynamic. So I would just caution artists who are thinking about, hey, I'm going to fundraise for this and fundraise for that, but like, okay, but I hope you understand ICOs and like the dynamics that happened in 2017. And I hope you understand, you know, why things go up and down. And I hope that that's part of your practice, not just part of your funding. Yeah, thank you. Good point. Um, but I also think like this fundraising question um, was for specific projects or maybe for charities. Um, and if the traditional fundraising, maybe as you all know, like galas and um, uh, maybe people who, who give money is actually participate to the gala. It's also a status thing and um, a, a community of sorts, a very VIP community in so many ways. Um, it's just NFT brings, even though it's intangible, but brings these like little objects, but also this fundraising Maybe it's not all speculative. I think it's for, I know that Artpool have been helping some nonprofit organization. And um, as I mentioned earlier, and now I don't know if this talk was a talk before, but they, they're like um, some um, uh, like human rights uh, defense project uh, or feminist project. So um, I was thinking more about that and about the museum as well. So a museum that cannot, uh, that need actually to fundraise because it's very expensive to maintain the walls, the collection, et cetera. So it's also kind of part of a co certain communities every time. Go ahead, Pauline. <laughs> no, uh, I think like uh, it's, it's, it's the way you approach it, like at the, you know, the, the way you you give it to people but then i i agree with Jehan. what's happening afterward is there is a lot of speculation and i think the artist needs to be aware of this um but it's part of the game and it's just like a crazy velocity but you also have this in the physical world in the in the long with world. auctions and yeah I think like there, is, there is like the the, the resellance one it's it's some the terms we are aware of it. it it happened in the physical art world as well it's just we are talking about a, a shrink velocity of things happening in a very very short time in the nft i think um but then it's um i think that i i strongly believe in and i'm doing this on a day-to-day -day basis is is you know how can you work closely with different collaborators around the project um to make it happen um and i think like physical world is still very important and the curators onboarding with us and the museum onboarding with us um they are looking to fundraise with us um, for something very specific. Like we have artist residency, we had uh, a, a paying for a publication, we have paying for an exhibition. Like I think it's um, it's it's different type of activities, but they are looking into um, building a project that also bring more to the collectors. And and I think here it's maybe more a long term view to look into this, but um, it's. It's giving content, I mean, explaining what's the project, why, uh, what is this artwork about, what is the selection of works, and um, and I think we have to do this. We need to hammer this, um, and and speculation will always be there, I think. But we can also bring more people on board that um, that will have an interest on the long term as well. And I think it's going to find its own balance. That's what I believe. Uh, and I'm happy to have people supporting wherever they want to be doing in the secondary markets. I think they still support, they still pay for an NFT, they still help like a project happening. And I think this has value, you know. So then even if the piece is, is flipped afterward and it's sold way more, we have 
some technical ways to keep a royalties for the artists and for the artists to keep winning from this. Yeah, um, isn't the point of NFT to record all that? Like, yeah, 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 exactly. That's that's the point. But like with the project we are doing, like some artists decide to completely donate the 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 whole percentage of the work to the project um because they feel involved in the project or because they feel it's it's a good thing for their career or you know whatever or you have some project the artist keeps a share out of it um so they are partly winning monetary but they are also winning in in in, in creating value for their work because they are if it's financing a show their their work's going to be in the show so it's like um but yeah i think it's our work to 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 really uh, continue to do the work we've been doing for the past 10, 15 years for all of us here, you know, and uh, and 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 not giving up on this. It's it's explaining the work of the artists, their like what's their practice, their concepts, uh, showing that you know, yeah, they, they they are here to to put the finger on something, and and that that there is an interest that goes beyond. Um, the speculation and monetary interest, even if it's true, it's it's the interest of a lot of people. But it's you know we have to to all be aware of this and be straightforward with this. And why is that bad at the end if it's support the arts? You know, uh, I think that's uh, we are here in the same boat at the end. That's what I think. Thank you, Jehan. Did you want to react to that or? Okay, um. No, I mean, I, I think I, uh, yeah, it's okay. I, I, I was interested basically to go through the possibility and, and uh, of what NFT can offer in terms of, you know, what you do with them. Uh, that's why I was trying to, to kind of probe all of you, like as artworks, can you do fundraising? Can you do a ledger? Can they be like in place of stakeholders? Um, I'm going to, uh, unless somebody has anything to add, uh, there are a few questions here in the chat room. Um, one was a comment uh, by Benjamin Latsko. It's very long, so I'm kind of, if you want, you can ask it or comment yourself, Benjamin. But basically, you, you mentioned that NFT bring transparency to the transactions made by an artist about their own work. And uh, it doesn't have to be the artwork itself, um, but just basically the, avoid the hustling part. That's what you, you mentioned. So the so comment is in there if someone wants to read it. Um, Maya mentioned, uh, was worried about this um, NFT as visual art might create a parallel or alternative art world um, as a close circle, um, as opaque as a physical one. Um, that would, yeah, where um, thus actually secure visibility to a pool of chosen artists that would become the stars of NFT regardless of the depths of their research, etc., etc. Um, if I would just say it's already happening. The art world is full of many art worlds inside the art world. It's like the Russian dolls, it's uh, infinite. So we already have all those, we call them communities also, and sometimes they're opaque. But if anyone wants to answer about this opacity, because again, my understanding is in, the, in this NFT space, it's transparent. I think I can. Or, or is it? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting. It, it seems as though um, in recent months there are there are NFT stars. I mean, there were NFT stars last year as well. Um, and centralization seems to take place culturally um, between a select few. Um, I can certainly think of artists that stick in my mind for doing crazy things like Hakatel um, with their partnership with Christie's and uh, working with Blondie, like that really kind of did amazing things for their career. Um, but in a space that is so full of uh, profile pictures and one of one artworks and, um, you know, I think um, it's going to be really difficult for artists, regardless of how excellent their marketing is, to really say, like, I own this. Um, this is my this is my <laughs> this is my blockchain um i think every other week there will be a new there'll be a new artist around the corner i, I don't think that it's going to replace the traditional art world in any way um and i think they'll just simply coexist manifest itself start all over again uh, and rinse and repeat but i'd like to hear what other what the other speakers have to think about this 
anybody, anyone else? Aldo has had to leave because um, they have an exhibition to prepare, so he had to leave the conversation. But anyone else wants to say something about opacity? Irina, perhaps? Well, I mean, it depends, of course, um, who is doing the project, right? Uh, because still there is a human factor to it. Uh, blockchain is a tech and tech is neutral. And those who uh, make decisions, put things out there, create art, create a company around that or a gallery um, are still people. And we have many different people in the space. So it's still valid to watch for, you know, check the founders, uh, check the project, do your due diligence, uh, make sure that you are supporting legitimate art. Uh, it's not it's not copied because even though you know we hear about these cases of, of NFTs being copied, the art being stolen from large uh, NFT marketplaces, there is a way even with Google Images to make sure that you're buying the original one. It's very easy to track. It's very easy to search things on the internet. But do your own research. Make sure that you are connected uh, with the platform founders. You know, with Art Pool is very easy. You can join their uh, Telegram community, their Discord channel. Founders are very active on socials, and it gives you that reassurance that everything that the team does is legitimate, and they're supporting. They're very transparent about what they do. And if uh, if you can reach out to founders, if you can. Make sure that you know your your questions are answered. That you can address any concern. That is an indication that you are um, investing and in supporting the right project. But if the founders are unknown, there are oftentimes I see many of these websites where there is no no team, nobody, no point of contact. Uh, just yeah, make make sure it's still the diligence. It's physical world. The digital world is just a it's a medium, but it's yeah. the world of people. It's interesting because what you say really translates from the same advice given to uh, uh, emerging collectors. I was going to say young collector, but you can start whatever age you are. But, uh, but it's kind of the same, same advice you're giving. Due diligence, do your research. That's why the galleries has actually have a, a good role to play because you know, they, um, they also have a, a, a knowledge factor in this uh, passing passing of information about the artists, et cetera. So yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Anybody else? Maybe, maybe I can uh, chime in on that as well, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. No, of course. Yeah, I think that um, you know, one way to think about uh, this digital certificate is it's uh, obviously the, the kind of the tracking and the opacity and transparency is one thing, but it may be in a more broad way uh, for artists as you're, as you're trying to understand like what's the value of an NFT or what's the value, you know, what's, what's the additional utility or benefit. You can think of an NFT for an artwork as a platform, not just a certificate, but a platform upon which you can do many things. Tracing it, um, you know, seeing whose ownership, uh, you know, provenance, et cetera, that, that's one application uh, of utility. But there's a lot of other things. Um, financing, uh, the ability to use the artwork as collateral, uh, the ability to attach different types of data to it, the ability for that um, that artwork in the form of the NFT to be interoperable with other types of um, applications, whether it's uh, you know an art uh, storage system, or whether it's some type of uh, maybe a, a curatorial system. It's it's a the NFT itself gives a way and an anchor for information and applications to access that artwork. So in today's world, let's say I have a painting. If somebody writes about that painting, right, there's no way for me to know. Um, if I happen to come across it, great. Then maybe I'll cut out that piece of paper or maybe I'll store that PDF on my hard drive. But there's no real relation to that artwork and the, the universe of information and potential utility around it. But when you have an NFT, you can create different links that point to it. Um, and that starts to be, you know, this kind of accretive value in the digital space that we've never really had before. Um, and even if it's a physical artwork, if that physical artwork has a digital twin, which is an NFT, so maybe my painting, the artist, so like I, I collect work by a woman named Mika Marple. Mika Marple is an artist. She used to be the head of Night Gallery, a pretty famous gallery in LA. And so she has paintings, which also have um, component NFTs. Uh, so I own the painting, I own the NFT, 
And now whenever anything is written about that, or if it's shown, or if anybody wants to reference it, et cetera, they can literally reference the actual NFT itself. They don't need to take like, I don't need to send them a JPEG or something like that. They can just point towards the actual source material. And it's a pretty interesting way of, of having, you know, um, notions of authenticity, uh, and as we said, transparency into the source material. It's not just a, you know, there, oh, there's but so also many that's things. very interesting because, okay, one, thank you for contradicting Damien Hurst, who just issued NFT and artwork and decided that you have to buy one of you and the other is going to be uh, destroyed. I'm not contradicting, I'm not contradicting him. Uh, it's not it's in this. There's, there's, there's no right the... way. There's, 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 there's many different ways that you can kind of skin this cat and they're all okay, right? Okay, I'm sorry. I didn't mean in absolute, but in this notion of bringing extra information with the artwork in that way, it's contradicting, which I'm thankful because I find it very interesting. And also because curators often, um, especially with installation works, if they don't have access to the artist's notes or impression on how to install the work, uh, how to present it, if you have an NFT for museum work, et cetera, that, um, Cong aggregates all of this information and it can be indeed very useful. So just in this way, but go ahead, agree with Damien Hurst and everything. Like, I didn't mean that. I just want to underline uh, that. I don't really have a, I mean, I think that, you know, like I, don't, a, I don't love his work, but I think that what he, you know, this is a, at least a lot of people heard about NFTs through this. So fair enough. Yes, I think. And it's what we established also in the first uh, talk is that unfortunately, um, a lot of this, it's very noisy, all that talk. And in a way, it takes, it takes away from all the creativity that can be produced in this space. Um, that's what I realized, because we talk a lot about, okay, people, uh, Hearst, um, all the big things in name and, and speculation. And I'm just saying it can take away a little bit from, um, from I don't know, other, other, uh, there are always other solution, which um, brings me to no, a question no. by, yes, sorry, Pauline. No, I just want to say it's an open door. You, you also need this type of, of events for putting the light on things. And I think that's that's the, the good part of it. You know, be bold, earth, like at the end, I mean, I thank them for putting the light on NFTs, you know, and, and that we can have a conversation where we can build on it. I think that's, that's good in a way. So, um... In, I wanted to link with a question uh, asked by Margarida, which is, do you believe that NFTs are very American market and style oriented, more like a validation of pop culture? How will it evolve? Will it be more inclusive of, let's say, conceptual art? So I thought it was it linked well with what we just mentioned. Anyone? I think I can answer the second half of that question. I'm not entirely the sure about art. Yeah, so um, one genre that uh, Fanny and I are obsessed with at the minute is um, is crypto poetry. I, and, I was going to ask. About... Yeah, there we go. There we go. Um, so we we're obsessed with this organization, this gallery um, called the Verseverse, which I'll put in the in the chat. Um, and they concern themselves with how they can use um, NFTs and the utility around them in telling a story. So um, through utilities of the smart contracts, that's the NFT uh, with the person who owns it, and with the content that's in the NFT itself, um, you can encourage people to experience your, poet, your, your poetry in a particular way. Um, I can't really speak for one specific case study, um, but what I can say is that with conceptual art and even with like um, with Damien Hurst projects, which I, I don't know how conceptual art might be, um, there are interesting use cases of um, properties related around NFTs and um, how, say, like with things like generative art as well, um, you can you can change the appearance and the functionality of your NFT based on how long you own it, um, what edition you own, and so on and so forth. But uh, I think for conceptual art, NFTs are really exciting. Um, yeah. I think so too. And uh, maybe I'll refer uh, Margarita to the comments uh, made by Solomon in the previous talk, um, which were really meta um, and, and epistemological. So I um, think this hope. I understand what she means. Though, and I think it refers also to the hegemonial 
discourse in general and therefore it, it's not uh, particular to NFTs. So, but that's a geopolitical and longer conversation and we're reaching the end. Um, it's, anyone wants to add anything at this point? Uh, yeah, I mean, I just think, you know, thanks again for, for the opportunity to kind of chat about this stuff. I think uh, even though we've been mostly focused on fine art, um, I think that obviously the, the NFT space goes way further. Um, for us, we've been investing in things. Uh, we invest in a company called Snickerdoodle, uh, like the cookie, which is basically using NFTs uh, to replace browser-based cookies. So they're storing user data in NFTs. Uh, and we also invest in a company called Mnemonic, which is doing search and analytics uh, around the data inside of these NFTs. So I think that the use case, you know, art and design is really just the, the appetizer uh, for the potential of NFTs as a, as a, um, as a tool. Uh, but it's very likely in our mind that, um, you know, user data, financial data and industrial data, enterprise data will vastly, you know, kind of outclass uh, the art and content side of things. Um, as far as, you know, the way that NFTs are used. And again, it's, it's a function, right? Um, eventually, we won't talk about NFTs at all in the same way that we really talk about HTTP or FTP, although we use it every day. Yeah, no, very good point. I think Bruno made this point as well in a previous talk, but I would just say it's, uh, as Harry said before, he's very biased. I'm very biased. I would say, yes, I focus this talk on art in general, not only visual. Um, info conceptual on all kind of art, uh, but yeah, completely biased, and I'm proud of it. I don't. That's that's it. But uh, yes, Bruno also made a lot of point, and uh, thank you very much to all of you and to the previous speakers. Um, um, I learned a lot, so thanks a lot. Um, and you all gave me more incentive to look into it, and uh, I hope some of my colleagues will be just as enthusiastic. Thank you very much for your participation. We can find all the details. I think uh, my colleague put some information in the chat, but uh, we'll put it on Facebook, on Instagram, wherever on the website. Some more information about all the, the speakers and the websites and the bios um, and all of the links that have been shared and the recordings. Thank you, yes. Just on, on behalf of the whole Artpool team, Thanks, Christina, for moderating the two talks and to all our, our speakers. Um, I had a great afternoon, thanks to you. Um, and just to let you know that uh, this symposium is also the, the prelude of, a, of an educational program uh, we are working on. So it, uh, we will go deeper in each of the subjects. It's, it could be for some of the, I could read some comment that it was a bit frustrating. It's, it's a lot to cover and it's, it's, a, it's a very deep subject. So this is something we will work on and, and you will be able to you know, discover different, different approaches more in and are going to be uh, with us for your morning, afternoon, evening. <laughs> it was a pleasure, really. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you so much. Everybody. Everybody. Bye.